Up next in the broadcast, the nation focuses on the future of cyberspace with experts from close to 90 countries gathering here in Seoul to ponder questions about making this virtual world safe, secure and prosperous. Lawmakers zeroed in on the latest controversy surrounding the nation's nuclear safety during day four of the annual government audit. And over in the U.S., it's an end to the government shutdown and the resolution of the debt ceiling, at least for now, as Obama and Congress agree to take up the issue again early next year. Primetime News begins now. Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. It's Thursday, October 17th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I'm Yuji Hae. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin this evening with one of the biggest conferences in the world on cyberspace, currently being hosted here in Seoul for the next two days. It has brought together over 1,500 officials and experts from nearly 90 countries and 18 international organizations. They, under the theme of global prosperity through an open and secure cyberspace, the event will deal with crucial issues related to the virtual world, including security, the digital divide, economic growth, and capacity building. At an opening ceremony this Thursday, Thursday morning, President Park Geun-hye emphasized the need to narrow the digital divide between developing and developed countries by sharing know-how in the IT sector and called for international regulations to ensure cyber security. Internet 환경이 발달할수록 개인 정보 유출과 스팸, 악성 코드 유포를 비롯한 사이버 보안에 대한 위협도 갈수록 커지고 있습니다. 앞으로 사이버 공간의 개방성을 최대한 보장하면서도 이런 위험을 방지할 수 있도록 국제적 규범과 원칙을 함께 만들어 가야 합니다. The Seoul Conference is the third such meeting after the first gathering in London in 2011, followed by one in Budapest last year. Also in attendance at the global gathering, British Foreign Minister William Haig sat down with our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang sung Yi for a sideline chat. And here are his thoughts on a range of subjects from this year's Seoul Cyberspace Conference to President Park's upcoming state visit to London. British Foreign Minister William Haig says South Korea and the United Kingdom share the same ideals, even in cyberspace which is why Britain asked Seoul to host this year's global conference on cyber issues. So this is one of the most connected countries in the world. It's got some of the fastest internet speeds in the world. Uh, the population have a great understanding of, of the internet and its uses in, it, in the economy. And I think like us, uh, people in South Korea believe in an open and free internet. Speaking to Arirang News on the sidelines of the Seoul Conference on Cyberspace 2013, the top British diplomat said London is looking forward to President Park Geun-hye's state visit to Britain next month. With this year marking the 130th anniversary of bilateral ties between the two countries, Haig said the upcoming visit will be an opportunity to upgrade their relations to a new level. This is about making sure our relations are, are fit for the 21st century, encouraging our cooperation in science and in culture and the creative industries, making sure that we're building on recent increases in trade and investment that means more jobs and prosperity for people in Britain and in Korea. Haig said that Seoul and London have always maintained good cooperation on issues pertaining to North Korea's nuclear ambitions and reaffirmed Britain's firm commitment to lasting peace on the Korean peninsula. Uh, we have often expressed our condemnation in the past of, nuclear, of North Korea's uh, military programs, particularly nuclear program. And we would like to see it take a, a different direction in the future and we'll always urge it to do so. But there are issues that two countries remain divided on. Well, what's Britain's stance on Japan's recent push to lift its self-imposed ban on the right to exercise collective self-defense? Britain is a friend of many countries in this region, including Japan, and of course very much including South Korea. And it is very important for 
countries, particularly the, the free democracies of this region, to play a steadily bigger role in world affairs. Uh, it's important that Japan also uh, is able to pursue that contribution to international peace and security. The visiting British diplomat, who recently expressed support for Japan's collective self-defense, said that with all the conflicts that have taken place in history, Europe understands the concerns of Japan's neighboring countries like Korea and China. But he added that what Britain would like to see is these countries building mutual trust for a collective security in the Asia-Pacific region. Hang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And now let's get a local perspective of the cybersecurity situation here in Korea, especially as it pertains to threats from Pyongyang. We connect live to a cybersecurity expert, Dr. Yoon Min Woo, professor of police science and security studies at Kacheon University. Thank you very much for joining us. So, Professor Yoon, how confident should the Korean public be of the current level of cybersecurity in the nation? Well, the Korean public has uh, little confidence on the cybersecurity situation today because, you know, we actually uh, achieved highly developed uh, inf information in, in, uh, technology infrastructure so uh, we can use a pretty high speed internet. But the problem is our level of security on this is, you know, little developed. In, 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 in association with this infrastructure, so it's pre, you know, uh, worrisome uh, situation. And Professor, as seen from a series of attacks earlier this year, North Korea's cyber assaults have become increasingly rampant. Why has the regime moved to mounting cyber attacks and away from more traditional forms of provocation? Well, because the cyber, cyber uh, threat is pretty, you know, uh, safe for a perpetrator because you know perpetrator always can uh, you know hide behind. But the problem is, you have to prove it's uh, you know nation state's uh, action or individual action. That's the important thing thing you have to prove. But it's, it's extremely difficult. So uh, North Korea, you know, if they uh, commit a cyber attack, it, they can always you know have excuses. Then also, uh, North Korea is looking for a long-term strategy uh, by, you know, use of uh, cyberspace. I mean, here they have dilemma, and they have to, uh, you know, uh, deal with arms race game. So their strategy may going for a cyber, cyber, cyber security threat and cyber terrorism, combine, com uh, combining with nu nuclear, you know, nuclear programs, with, you know terrorist attack uh, by use of, you know, special forces or just, you know, North Korean agents. So what are some of the biggest challenges when it comes to ensuring security in the cyber arena? Is it possible to keep up with the criminals? Well, it's extremely difficult because the biggest challenge is there's no border in cyberspace. And cyberspace actually uh, disrupted the you know modern nation's state system. So law enforcement is based on national sovereignty within the boundaries. I mean that there's you know national border. But cyberspace actually disrupted all this. So I mean, you know, whatever it happens and nation state actually the one who has who has to enforce the law, but they cannot deal with it because perpetrator is not it's not within their, you know, national border. And Professor, we are aware that there is no control tower that manages cyber attack threats as a national level in South Korea. So shouldn't the government be doing more to strengthen the country's defenses against these attacks? So first, we have to uh, combine cyber warfare, cyber security, and cyber crime matters in total approach. Because in the cyberspace, simple criminal matters, it's easily inter intermingled with security issues and warfare issues. So crime and terror is linked these days. So it's, it's a possible in cyberspace significantly. So we, we need really uh, this uh, integrated total approach to elevate level of uh, you know, social security and national security at the same time. So uh, there's a control agency need to coordinate uh, law, enforcement, law enforcement measures and national security measures, and we have to redesign. But, uh, you know, again, at this time, hmm. we have none of those. 
Well, Professor Yoon, thanks so much for joining us tonight and sharing, sharing with us your insights. Okay, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Before your day ends and another begins, get the latest news live from Seoul. Residents whose features restrictions is on the rise. Closing ceremony. Expert analysis from Asia's heartbeat. The legislature, circumstances. With a viewpoint only Korea's global network can provide. The United States, the latest report. Unrivaled access from a team always on standby. Meaning came on from the river trying to cover up the South. And at the nation's top office, President Pakine held bilateral talks with her Philippine counterpart on this Thursday. President Aquino is here for a two-day stay visit to discuss trade, investment, development, and cultural exchanges. Our presidential office correspondent Ojunju has the details. President Pak's bilateral summit with visiting Philippine President Benigno Aquino was an extension of her push for sales diplomacy towards the ASEAN region following her Southeast Asia tour last week. During their talks, the Korean president once again highlighted her economic and strategic emphasis on the region, citing the Philippines' remarkable growth in recent years. Uh, PIP라고 할 정도로, 그러니까 베트남, 인도네시아, 그다음에 필리핀이라고 할 정도로. In particular, Presidents Pak and Aquino promised to work closely together on defense and signed an MOU for defense cooperation following their talks. Currently, negotiations between the two countries are ongoing on the export of 12 Korean F A 50 fighter jets worth some $450 million to the Philippines. President Peck also called on the Philippine government to ease regulations on foreign investment and support Korean companies operating there. In response, Aquino vowed to support Korean firms seeking to take part in major infrastructure projects in his country, such as the extension of the Manila Light Rail Transit System and an airport construction project. President Aquino's visit to Korea was the first state visit by a foreign leader during the Peck administration. The two nations share a long history of diplomatic ties dating back to 1949, and based on that, the two leaders agreed to work towards shared growth. Oh Jin Ju, Arirang News. And on day four of the parliamentary audit here in Korea, the country's power authorities were grilled over allegations of corruption and negligence. Arirang News' political correspondent Kim Young Ji reports on how lawmakers particularly focused on the nation's nuclear industry and the response to Japan's nuclear fallout. The Shingori nuclear reactors 3 and 4 were supposed to be operational by next August or September. But the new start date will now be pushed back by up to a year. Control cables supplied by JS Cable failed to pass quality assurance tests, which were conducted after power authorities received a tip in late April that fake test reports had been used in the reactors. The control cable is a device that sends a signal to the safety system in the event of an accident at the plant. The parts in question will have to be replaced a process that is expected to take six months to one year. Reactors 3 and 4 at the Shingori plant have a capacity of 1.4 million kilowatts each. Experts say the postponement will create a more acute power shortage crisis next year compared to the one the country went through this past summer. Power authorities project that this qualification of Shingori control cables will cost the Korean economy some 3 trillion won or 2.8 billion U.S. dollars in damage per year. These new findings took center stage when the Parliamentary Committee for Science and Future Planning met for an audit of power authorities Thursday. We will be losing 1.4 million kilowatts in each of the Shingori units because they won't be complete. Are you working on countermeasures? Power authorities are working on them. The Japanese media reported that 40 percent of all nuclear power plant parts that Korea imports from Japan do not go through a safety inspection process, not even a check on related documents. Is this true? There are no safety checks. We at that time didn't have the authority to do a security check on the parts. 
The lawmakers also criticized the nuclear power authority's tepid response after Japan announced that tons of radioactive water was leaking from the Fukushima power plant. They demanded that the Nuclear Safety and Security Commission do more to ensure nuclear safety, including conducting its own radioactivity tests on marine products from Japan. Kim Hyunji, Arirang News. Finally, the showdown is over in Washington. President Barack Obama signed a bipartisan deal to raise the nation's debt ceiling and ended a 16-day government shutdown just hours before a Thursday deadline. Kim ji reports on the deal. President Obama signed the budget bill into law early on Thursday, effectively ending a fiscal impasse that had brought the U.S. to the brink of what would have been a potentially disastrous debt default. The deal was crafted on Wednesday in the Senate, where it was approved by a vote of 81 to 18, and was then sent over to the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, which passed the deal with 285 votes in favor and 144 against. Our country came to the brink of a disaster. But in the end, political adversaries set aside their differences and disagreements to prevent that disaster. The agreement will fund the government until January 15th and extend the country's $16.7 trillion borrowing limit until February 7th. The agreement also leaves President Obama's signature health care law virtually intact, representing a major defeat for Republican conservatives in the House who had wanted to either defund or delay it. This is far less than many of us had hoped for, frankly, but it's far better than what some had sought. Now it's time for Republicans to unite behind other crucial goals. The deal also stipulates the creation of a panel comprised of members of the House and Senate to draw up another longer-term budget deal by December 13th, which means that this could be the beginning of another round in a long-running debate over the federal budget. Most importantly for federal workers, the plan also provides compensation for hundreds of thousands of government employees who have been on temporary leave since October 1st. The White House Budget Office said they should expect to return to work on Thursday. Kim ji Arirang News. The South Korean government has expressed deep regret over Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's decision to make a ritual offering to a controversial war shrine at the start of the nation's annual autumn festival. Abe skipped a visit to the Yasukuni shrine, which would have prompted strong condemnations from neighboring countries, but he did send a masakaki tree, which is used in Shinto rituals. Seoul's foreign ministry spokesman Cho Tae-young said on Thursday that Abe's offering glorifies Japan's past wartime atrocities and honors the war criminals enshrined there. The Yasukuni Shrine is a key symbol of Japan's imperial past and honors many convicted Class A criminals along with millions of Japanese war dead. And here's the latest on the Laos plane disaster that killed all 49 passengers, including three Koreans. Officials there say they are trying to recover the bodies from the Lao Airlines plane that crashed into the Mekong River near Pakse Airport in southern Laos, largely due to bad weather associated with Tropical Storm Nari. Eight bodies have been recovered so far, non-Koreans, and the recovery efforts could take a while because of low visibility due to poor water quality. From a military alliance to a global partnership marking 60 successful years of the Korea-U.S. alliance, former Korean and U.S. ambassadors gathered here in Seoul today to further cement those ties and discuss regional issues of mutual concern. Han da was there. Eight former Korean and U.S. ambassadors sat down for a special roundtable event in Seoul on Thursday to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Korea-U.S. alliance. During the rare forum, co-hosted by the Korea Foundation and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the distinguished panel reflected upon the past few decades of Korea-U.S. relations and exchanged views on pending regional issues. And North Korea, of course, was at the center. The group of senior diplomats gave out various opinions on ways to deal with the North. And her policy of trust politique, I hope, becomes stronger and stronger as it goes on. With the uh, help of the United States leadership, and with the participation of all the concerned parties, we may be able to make a major step forward toward unification. 
Alexander Vershbau, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Korea from 2005 to 2008, stressed the importance of China's role in restarting halted multilateral dialogue and bringing about a solution to the North Korea deadlock. When asked about the need of a Korea-U.S. bilateral alliance, even after the North Korean threat is mitigated, all agreed that the two nations' ties go beyond security cooperation. From the Korean point of view, uh, of course, uh, it, it is uh, about economic uh, prosperity, about democracy, about human rights. Although the need to maintain a strong alliance was agreed upon, ambassadors said they hoped the U.S. troops in Korea would gradually have a reduced role on the peninsula because of improved inter-Korean relations. I hope that eventually we can uh, mutate to uh, a larger naval presence on a rotating basis, and I would hope that uh, the Second Infantry Division could gradually be uh, phased out. The panel discussion was concluded by reaffirming that the Korea and the U.S. have the vitality to move forward for the next six decades to come through strong and combined determination. And then, I did the news. The KBO playoff series between the Tucson Bears and LG Twins continue with Game 2 in Seoul. And Stephen Che joins us from the Sports Center to give us the highlights. Stephen. Hey guys, it seems like all we do is talk baseball, but hey, it's because it's October. Now let's go straight to the tape. It's EJ U for Tucson, Radames Liz for LG. Now we go straight to the second. He's in big trouble. He walks two, then some hits later, including this double by Pak Yong Tech. It brings home two runs. LG's up 2 0. He's pulled, and Bears put in Derek Hankins. Meanwhile, the Twins' Liz doesn't give up a hit until the fifth, and that's the only one he gives up to go along with his 10 Ks for the night as he leaves after eight innings. And the Twins go on to win this one with a final score of 2 0, tying up the series. And from the field to the back office, the KBO and its 10 clubs have decided against Changwon City's decision to build the NC Dino's new stadium in the city district of Chinhe. The league decided to back NC in rejecting the city's proposal for the stadium site, saying that it's NC that's directly linked to the deal. The Dino said that the location does not fit with its standards and thus would not be a good investment by Changwon. The city is set to use close to $100 million in public funds for the stadium. And we end things with a look at the top matchups in the KBL. We begin with action between the Seoul teams, the Samsung Thunders and the SK Knights at Chamshir. And SK's Aaron Haynes was in it to show why he was last season's MVP. He goes 21-12 and 12 for his second double-double of the season, along with his teammate Courtney Sims, who also gets one with his 14-11. and 11. The Knights beat the Thunders 83-71. Elsewhere, the ET Land Elephants took on the Koyang Orions at Irsan. And it, was, it came down to the last five seconds, but ET Land eked out the win as Ricardo Powell went for 21 points, five boards, and five assists. ET Land over the Orions 76-73. That does it for me here in the Sports Center. This has been Stephen Che. Check back at midnight for the latest in the world of sports.
It's been chilly here in the nation over the past few days with temperatures dipping below average for this time of the year. All right, let's find out if we'll get a break from the cold weather in time for the weekend by going over to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center. Bogyang. Hey guys, bear with the cold through tomorrow morning because temperatures will rise to average autumn numbers starting tomorrow afternoon. Let's take a look at the satellite map for details. Well, we have clear skies in the central regions due to a high pressure system that is moving east from China. China. However, clouds are moving in down south, and tomorrow doesn't look to be much different. There is a slight chance of light showers on Jeju Island on Friday, so those of you in Jeju should carry a small umbrella with you just in case. Other than that, the average daytime high around the nation should reach 22 degrees. As it may be a foggy morning in the central regions, please be careful on the roads. Moving on to tomorrow's forecast. Seoul and Daegu dropped to 8 degrees in the morning before reaching 21 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, Gwangju and Busan hit 22 and 21 degrees respectively. Moving on to other regions, Jeju starts off the morning at 15 degrees with a high of 20. Meanwhile, Dokdo and Mount Kumgang peak at 17 and 11 degrees respectively. That's all for now and I'll be back with more updates after midnight. Thanks, Bo Kyung. And that's our broadcast on this Thursday night. I'm Yuji Hain Seoul. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. We'll see you soon.